guys, it's Kayla here from Journey Dog Training, and we're here today for Training Tuesday to talk about introducing dogs to cats or cats to dogs, um, whichever way your household is growing. And you guys might notice that I am not currently coming to you guys live. That is because I am recently moved to Mexico and the internet here is not fast enough for live streaming, at least where I currently am here in La Paz, the southernmost tip of Baja, California. So I apologize, I'm probably more bummed about the live thing than you guys are, um, but just so you know. Part of the reason that I'm here talking to you guys for free about this is because I also offer um, behavioral support for dog and cat owners anywhere in the world. So I'm an associate certified dog behavior consultant. I also have a couple years of working with cats with behavior issues. And I offer both video and phone support where we can work one-on-one -on -one through some problems or um, I have some email and WhatsApp support and I offer that to anyone anywhere in the world, um, pretty much with any issue that you guys are running into with your dogs and cats. There are some cases where I might recommend that you work with an in-person trainer or a vet behaviorist. Um, it just kind of depends, but there are a lot of things that we can get done and pretty much anything I can at least help you guys make it better. So let's talk about introducing dogs to cats. So. When I talk to people about this problem, I kind of run into two different extremes. So there's kind of the, the, the group of people who believe that dogs and cats are never gonna get along. Um, and that comes with some baggage, although on the plus side, that sometimes leads to people becoming um, really cautious, which often is kind of a good thing with this. And then there's people who maybe still believe dogs and cats are never going to get along, but either way, they're kind of just like, meh, whatever, we'll just throw them together. It'll be fine. They'll sort it out. They're animals, right? Um, and both of those are kind of wrong. <laughs> um, and if you guys are watching this, it's probably because you guys recognize that there's something that you need to be doing to introduce your dog to your cat or your cat to your dog, and you just don't know what. Um, so let's talk about it from kind of the absolute best case scenario and then move on down in uh, kind of increasing intensity. So in my opinion, a best case scenario is something along the lines of introducing a cat who's used to dogs to a dog that's used to cats, introducing a dog that's used to cats to a kitten that is still within its socialization period, or introducing a cat that's used to dogs to a puppy that's still within its socialization period. So there's kind of those three three different tiers of it. Um, and then as soon as you guys are trying to introduce an adult animal to another adult animal, and at least one of them has never met the other species before or never lived successfully with the other species before, then things start getting really complicated. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So whenever we're introducing a dog to a cat um, or a cat to a dog, there's basically three different stages that we want to look at for that introduction. So that first stage, right away, what we want to do is we want to divvy up the house. And then we're going to have complete separation <laughs> between dogs and cats. This stage, um, in like absolute best case scenario, might only last a couple of hours or even a day or two. Um, but I have had clients where this stage has lasted for like six months. Um, again, kind of just depends on what we're dealing with here. And often what this looks like is confining the cat. If the cat is the new one, to the bathroom, and that does a couple things. It lets the cat kind of decompress and get used to their space. That cat can get used to its litter box. It helps prevent a lot of litter box issues. And, you know, it's just a nice small space. If the cat is the current resident and the dog is the new one, then you might want to figure out how to split up the house more kind of 50-50. And that might mean putting the cat in the bedroom and the dog gets the rest of the house, or maybe the cat gets the bedroom, bathroom, living room. I mean, it just depends on where your doors are. Um, and then, during this stage, what we're going to do is we're going to feed the animals at the same time on opposite sides of the door. So that they're learning that when I hear or smell or whatever, that other animal, I'm also getting food. So we're doing a little bit of classical counter conditioning here where they learn that the other animal makes food happen. That's awesome. Um, it also distracts them a little bit. So that's good. And then the other thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to be scent swapping. So that means putting up blankets, towels, beds, whatever for them to sleep on and then swapping them every day or so, so that the animals are getting to smell each other. So for us humans, we often forget how much scent is kind of the king of the animal world because we have crappy noses. We just think about sight because we're very visual animals. For our dogs and our cats, that's very different. So scent swapping is really, really important. Um, 
So we've got them in total separation and we're doing some scent swapping. And then from there, what I like to do is setting up a baby gate system. This might look for a lot of us who have owned cats, we know that cats are not going to be stopped by just a single baby gate. A lot of dogs aren't going to be stopped by a single baby gate. So you might need to stack multiple baby gates. I've seen, you know, basically just baby gates up the door. I also have seen people um, going ahead and getting like a, a like a, a goodwill door essentially and cutting holes in it and putting grates in it. I've seen some really, really cool stuff from some of my clients. Um, and this stage is going to be more important depending on how much of a struggle you guys are having. So like with my dog who is pretty savvy with cats and whenever he's meeting a cat who's already met a couple dogs, we pretty much can just separate them for a couple hours, do some sweat scent swapping, do a little bit of training to make sure that the dog understands that he's not to chase the cat and that the cat doesn't run away, which makes things worse, and then we're good. But if we're struggling here, this stage is really important. So we've got some sort of visual um, mesh up where the animals can see each other and there's more airflow for that scent, but they can't physically get to each other. And you might have to get creative with how you do that. Often the baby gate setup works best, but again, I've seen some really interesting setups here that I really applaud my clients for getting creative and figuring out something that works for them. From there, then we're just going to continue doing that same thing where we're feeding the animals on opposite sides of the door um, at the same time. And a lot of times, um, if there's one animal that is kind of fixated on the other animal or is more nervous about the other animal, this is also a stage where we want to get into some training and counter conditioning. So let's talk about the dog first. Generally, the dog here is going to be interested, maybe wanting to play, maybe wanting to chase. Either way, what I like to do there is doing a lot of engage, disengage games and treat and retreat stuff. So basically we're going to have the dog come up near the gate while the cat is maybe eating, you know, maybe your partner's feeding the cat. You've got the dog, dog's on leash so you can control, make sure he doesn't bum rush the door. And then if he looks at the kitty, you just say, good, give him a treat and then take a couple steps back. Take a break, go up towards the gate again. He looks at the kitty, say, good, give him a treat take a couple steps back. So that's basically teaching the dog that when he notices the cat, he's gonna get fed. And then what he should do is back away. And what you can do is feed the dog again as you back away. So that's a really great option. Um, you guys can also incorporate some hand targets and mat training. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. So, and then essentially what I actually, what I really like doing here is we've got our, our grate up. So whatever that grate may look like, the animals can see each other. But what often works well, if you're having a little bit of, a, of trouble here, don't go just straight, straight from a door to a wall of baby gates. Have a towel pinned up with clothespins or something, and then gradually increase how much of the, of the grate is visible versus just that solid towel. So um, that's something that you guys can also try as well. And again, we're feeding on opposite sides. We're still doing the scent swapping. Basically, anytime the animals notice each other and make a good choice, so that choice might be to come up and check each other out, or it might be to retreat. Either way, we're gonna go ahead and reward that good behavior if we notice it. And at this stage, it's pretty important to not scold the animals around each other, even if you're seeing some inappropriate behavior from one of them. If you're seeing inappropriate behavior that you don't like, that is a cue that you need to go back to the next step. So, so far we've got step number one, where they're on total, total separation and we're just scent swapping and feeding on opposite sides of the door. Two, we're doing the same thing, but there's some amount of visual contact between the animals. We might have a towel up so we can moderate how much visual contact they're getting. And then we're also doing some of those engage, disengage games, rewarding the animals for making good choices. Number three then is going to be to actually start introducing them to each other without that physical barrier. Do not do this until they're doing really well with just a baby gate up, no towels, nothing. And we don't wanna have any oopsies happening um, when we actually take down those baby gates. And then what we wanna do is we wanna have that dog on leash and you can either use a tie down or have the dog tethered to you. Um, so I like to tie the dog to me generally, and I will just take a carabiner and clip my dog's leash to my belt. You guys can also clip the leash to, um, like the doorknob and then close the leash in the door. That's a pretty easy one. You, you, you know, get creative, but have the the dog tied down the dog and don't, ha don't be holding the leash. Um, just so you've got your hands free. The dog is tied down. And then we're going to be going back to doing those engage disengage games. Often what's going to need to happen is the cat is going to need some time 
to relax and explore. You can leave some food out, but we don't want to be luring the animals closer and closer to each other. So we can, you know, basically encourage the cat to explore by having some food out, but we don't want to set up like this treasure trail where the cat is trying to get to the food despite being terrified of the dog. So that distinction can be a little bit tricky. And again, this is where it's helpful to have a professional like myself helping. Um, and while we're doing that, we're basically feeding the dog. Anytime the dog checks in with us or notices the cat, we can say, good, we can feed the dog. And we're just monitoring. So this is also a great place for looking at that dog decoder app, which I think is like three bucks or something. Um, and you can get that and you can start getting yourself used to dog body language. And they also have some posters at dog decoder on cat body language and start looking for some of those signs of stress and keeping an eye out for those here. As things continue going well here, then we can start adding in more movement for either animal and just continuing to reward the animals for making good choices. If we have any slip ups here, again, that means that we're going back a step. And at this stage, we probably don't want to be leaving them unattended. So whenever we're out of the house or we're not kind of in training mode, we're going to put them back into the great separated scenario. As things start going really, really well here, you might be able to start basically leaving the dog out while you're around, but you're not necessarily in training mode and eventually we'll be able to lead up to full cohabitation. So last time I did this with my dog with a cat that was not dog savvy and my dog is, he's cat savvy, but he's much better with cats that are dog savvy because they're not going to run when when cats run, he wants to chase. Um, so when we did this last time, I think it, took us about four days to get through all of these steps with a dog that's relatively cat savvy and a cat that was not dog savvy at all. Um, I've had other scenarios with my dog where he's been fine with a new cat on day one. And I've had other scenarios with my dog where he and the cat kind of never were okay um, after a week or two. I've never had a scenario with my current dog where he was never okay for months and months. But I have worked with multiple clients where one or more of the animals is not okay with the other one for months and months. So that's best case scenario. Might take a couple hours, might take a couple days. In general, expect at least a couple days of figuring out how to monitor keeping the animals totally separate. I will throw out as well, I would not recommend putting the dog in the crate and having the cat out and about or having the cat in a crate and leaving the dog out and about. With the cat, this can lead to kind of a feeling of being trapped and terrified, and it can be really, really scary for the cat, especially if the dog is really interested in the cat. And with, a, uh, with the dog in the crate and the cat out and about, this could create some barrier frustration where the dog wants to get to the cat. And especially because in the scenario where you're probably gone, you're not doing anything to mitigate the situation and you're actually kind of teasing the dog with the cat. And again, that can lead to worse barrier frustration or what looks a lot like aggression later on. Um, so I would not recommend leaving either animal in the crate where they are <laughs> trapped. Um, and Barley agrees. So we've talked a little bit about what to do if one of the animals is nervous. Um, the big thing is just going slower, rewarding the animals more heavily. Um, if you're having a hard time finding something that works for your cat, if you're having something that, having a hard time finding a treat that works for your cat, I really recommend um, Gerber's meat flavored baby food. I think it's like Gerber's second foods. It's what we used at the shelter. Most cats really like it. Otherwise, temptation treats are pretty good. Um, Bonito flakes. There's kind of a whole bunch of different treats that can work really, really well for cats. Um, in general, baby food is good first place to start. You can then just dip that onto like a pretzel stick um, or a popsicle stick for treat delivery or a syringe. Um, and then you can use that to reward your cat as you go along. Most dogs, it's a little bit easier to find some food. And note that if either one of your animals normally eats and normally takes treats and isn't eating or taking treats in this training scenario, your training scenario is too hard. Some other basic body language things to be looking for um, would be dilated pupils. So watch if your cat's pupils all of a sudden just whoosh, get huge. It's probably too much. Same for your dog. Um, whisker flares. So if your either one of your animals whiskers just pops forward, um, not a good sign. That's all signs of fear, stress, anxiety. You know, just not good feelings. We want. We want nice and relaxed. Um, ears being pinned back or all the way forward in either animal, not usually a good sign. 
cat's tails that are flicking or thrashing either way not a great sign pilo erection fluffed up hair on other species not a good sign um and really high tiktok tail wags i don't like seeing in dogs either what i do like seeing with the dog is basically a light relaxed pant or no pant at all um you know not fixated on the cat not staring maybe a sweeping tail wag uh no whining no signs of over arousal but basically just kind of a nice chill looking dog and kind of the same from the cat um we love seeing meatloaf position where the cat has tucked all of his limbs in under himself you know that really cute yeah you know the, everything's all tucked in or a cat that's nice and sprawled out on his side or a cat that's just kind of you know that sassy cat walk where he's got his tail up and like the question mark behind him that's great um all of those are really really good to see or a cat that's just sitting up but looking relaxed um and if your cat is like scrunched in the corner meatloaf position that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about the nice relaxed like plumped you know when they when, when they're mushy and it's cute you know all right so what else do we need to talk about um prey drive so this is kind of the nightmare for dog cat introductions is a dog that has high prey drive and really actually maybe wants to eat your cat um the first thing i'm gonna say is if you have a dog that has killed and or eaten um yeah mostly killed and eaten or attempted to catch and kill um squirrels bunnies cats um especially if it's actually literally been another cat i want you guys to get professional help here um and it might just be that you're going to perpetually have a split household because it just might never be safe for your cat to share a home with that dog i'm not saying that a dog that killed a, a mouse once can never be safe around your cat but the closer that thing that your dog killed or ate or tried to kill and eat is to a cat the more dangerous things get and again i want you guys to work with a professional in that case because bad things can happen otherwise if we're looking at prey drive the big thing is we're just going to be spending a lot more time with that dog working on different engage disengage games potentially teaching the dog some appropriate ways to get that prey drive out i really love flirt poles for this um and then really working on teaching that dog that the cat is not a thing to chase and with that what's really helpful is teaching the cat that running is a really bad idea because again my dog is really pretty good with cats as long as they don't book it away from him but if they start running he wants to chase um and i'm pretty confident he's not going to hurt them um i just i know my dog well i've seen him around thousands of other animals of all different species um but you don't necessarily know that and even if you do know that with your dog i still don't let barley chase cats even though i know he's i'm I, I and i don't know that's the thing too i'm a professional dog behavior consultant i cannot say for sure my dog would never hurt a cat so if we're worried about prey drive get help from a professional and spend a lot more time in those protected contact scenarios really working on rewarding the dog for disengaging from the cat um and if again if you work with a trainer they'll have some other tricks and games up their sleeves and again i want you guys to look for someone who is savvy with both dog and cat behavior and i want you to look for someone who's going to be talking about things like counter conditioning and engagement games i don't want you to be looking for someone who's talking about you know corrections alpha dominance all this sort of stuff because your dog is not trying to kill your cat because your dog wants to be alpha or dominant your dog wants to kill your cat because he's a dog and he's a predator um and alpha rolling your dog or correcting your dog or whatever is unlikely to really fix the problem counter conditioning can actually help change some of those underlying urges but we're also kind of working with against genetics here so in certain cases i have seen cases where i've just worked with a client and just said I don't know if we can ever get this to a safe place. This is relatively it's not common, but I see this a little bit more often with dogs like sight hounds, greyhounds and whippets, um and huskies and other breeds, uh akitas. There's just there are some breeds that still have a lot more of that hunting drive left in them than others versus when we're looking at things like our labs and our collies and stuff where they are much more bred to be safe around small squeaky things um you know so it depends and if we're really really worried about our dog's prey drive we need to be getting help from a professional and we need to be being realistic about it i've seen a lot of amazing success stories but you do not want 
to get involved with this without help um, and have something terrible happen. So some other things to keep in mind before we go. Um, some baseline skills that are really, really helpful for your dog to have are going to be a hand touch, which you guys can see my full class on teaching Winston the puppy how to do this um, below. And it's like 45 minute. There was like five training sessions involved where I show basically start to finish teaching this dog a hand touch. We can use that then whenever the dog looks at the cat, we can ask him to touch. He moves away, he touches his nose to our hand. Voila, we get a treat. Um, similarly for the cat, you can teach the cat a nose touch. Boop. I taught this to a cat named Poppy, um, actually the same day I taught Winston, and you guys can see that video here as well. Um, and then mat training. So this is really, really useful. You guys can actually click below again and see a video of me using mat training to introduce Barley to um, a cat that was very nervous about him. This is nice because it keeps the dog lying down and staying still, and you can feed both animals at the same time, but they're actually in the same space. Um, and the important thing with both the hand touch and the mat training is that it's really, really important you guys to teach your animals this to what we want to call fluency before we start to use it to introduce the two animals to each other. So if your dog still only responds to that hand touch, you know, like 70% of the time in a nice calm situation, he's not ready for this in a really high adrenaline, high stress scenario, like introducing him to a cat. So we want to get to the point where your dog is able to respond to those cues, you know, say around a squirrel or um, at least outdoors in highly distracting scenarios before we start trying to practice it with your cat. So that's the thing to keep in mind with both of those skills. We want your dog and your cat to be really good at them before we try to use them here. Number three is going to be exercise and enrichment for both of the animals. So especially when we're reducing our animal's space, um, and this is a stressful time, we wanna make sure that we're keeping them both busy. So for cats, I really recommend, well, both cats and dogs, I really recommend puzzle toys. I've got a great list of cat-friendly puzzle toys here. Um, so you guys can check those out. I also highly recommend um, flirt poles for both dogs and cats, helps get some of that exercise energy out and it doesn't take much. Um, for cats, it's generally called a da bird toy. And um, again, I'll link that here. Um, and just making sure that we're getting our animals, both animals, adequate exercise and enrichment, and not just physical, but also that mental and emotional. With that, we can also talk a little bit about some different supplements. There are some different calming supplements that might help a little bit here. Things like Adaptil and Feel Away can help a little bit. There have been some studies that found that they're helpful and also some studies that have found that they're pretty much placebos. So um, some people swear by them, other people really don't see a difference. My dog um, used Composure for quite a while when we first started moving around a lot. I don't know if it helped. I really didn't notice a difference, but who knows, maybe he would have been worse without it. So you guys can go ahead and try some of those things, but what I really want to urge you is I don't want you guys to get really fixated on Adaptil and Feel Away and Thunder Shirts and blah, 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 blah you know, all these different kind of what's the word, auxiliary treatments and neglect the nuts and bolts of what we need to be doing, which is that counter conditioning and that nice slow intro. So don't just go out and try to retail your therapy your way through this with different supplements and diffusers and whatever. You still need to do the work, okay? So got hand targets and mats. Those are really, really helpful for dogs. The hand target is also really useful for a cat. Exercise and enrichment. Um, number four is talking a little bit about some of those supplements. Go ahead and use them. I don't think they can hurt, but don't waste your time on them if you have limited bandwidth. Um, number five, house soiling. This is really common for cats when they're stressed out about a new animal in their homes or being new into a home. So if you guys are starting to see litter box issues, um, go back, go back, go back. Do whatever it was that you were just doing where your cat was last successful with the litter box and do more of it. Um, if you guys have the cat currently confined to the bathroom and you are at step one and you are having litter box issues, email me, Kayla at journeydogtraining.com. We can set up a 15 minute call, um, and, or we can set up some email back and forth. Um, either one for a really small fee. It's really affordable. And I can help you guys. If you guys are seeing problems already at that stage, it's a red flag. Otherwise, you know, if you guys are currently at the visual contact stage, 
and you start seeing litter box problems, go back, all right? Or put the towel over more, increase exercise and enrichment for the cat. Generally, we always wanna make sure that the cat is getting a veterinary workup whenever we see any house soiling issues arise. If we literally just got a new dog and then like the next day the cat starts having litter box issues, I'm not as concerned about medical stuff. I'm not a vet though, so it never hurts to go see the vet. And if this persists, um, we want to go talk to the vet to make sure that there isn't just some terrible coincidence of a UTI or some other disease coming up with your cat. Um, so with house soiling, the biggest thing is to try to go back and then try to increase exercise and enrichment and basically just reduce stress for your cat. The name of the game with litter box issues other than health is stress reduction. And if you guys need more help with that, again, go ahead and email me, Kayla at journeydogtraining.com. And again, I can set you guys up with a 15 minute phone call or a one hour phone call if you wanna talk for longer um, and or some email support to get you guys off on the right track with that. And if we are seeing aggression from the cat to the dog, also a big cause for concern. Again, that's a place where I want you guys to get help. So you guys can again reach out to me or you can go to iaabc.org slash consultants and you can find a dog or a cat behavior consultant near you. Many cat behavior consultants are really good about doing remote stuff. So if you don't go with me, go with someone else from the IAABC, the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants. They're fantastic. So I think we've gone on for long enough. I know that there is tons more to talk about in this um, subject area. It's a big one, but I need to go. I want to have dinner. Um, so just to recap, best case scenario, what we're going to do is protected contact with scent swapping. We feed the animals on opposite sides of that door and we reward them for good behavior, especially kind of noticing the other animal and then choosing to walk away. Number two, visual contact that might be stacked baby gates with a towel so you can modulate how much of each other they can see. Um, continuing to do the same stuff, bulking it up a little bit on the training. Number three is going to be doing that introduction of the dog on leash um, and really encouraging the animals not to interact. Um, and then we talked a little bit about what to do when the cat's nervous, what to do if the dog has high prey drive. And then we wrapped it up talking about the, t the fact that hand touches, and tar hand touches and mat training are really, really helpful skills for your dog in particular to know, but hand targets are also really useful for the cat when you're doing this introduction. We talked a little bit about exercise and enrichment. We talked about the fact that some of these auxiliary treatments, um, they might help, but they also can take your energy. So choose your battles and you really need to stick to the basics, nuts and bolts of the training. And if you have limited mental, physical, emotional, financial bandwidth, don't focus on those auxiliary treatments. And then house soiling, we talked about some basic fixes for house soiling and the fact that with both house soiling and aggression, if you're having a hard time, reach out to me. And if you don't wanna work with me, no hard feelings, you can find another cat behavior consultant at IAABC dot org slash consultants and again i'm kayla from journey dog training and i take clients from anywhere in the world so if you want help from me go to journeydogtraining.com slash shop and you guys can see some of my different offerings right now if you guys are already at the place where you would like to buy please just go there rather than emailing me um, i have a ton of emails every single day guys and it's really much easier for me if you are already at the place where you're thinking you'd like to buy, if you can just go ahead and do that. But if you need to go back and forth, absolutely okay. I am here for you. So again, Kayla at journeydogtraining.com and we will see you soon. Mm -hmm.